Hey, thanks for tuning in. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 311. Today, we have a past guest back, one that you haven't heard from since their original appearance several years ago. And we're going to talk about the martial art they practice and how it relates to what you practice, how today's conversation might make you a better martial artist, regardless of your style. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, and I am the host of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. I am the founder of Whistlekick, the company dedicated to furthering your love, your enjoyment, your lifestyle as a martial artist. You can find everything we do at whistlekick.com. You can find the show notes for this, as well as all of our other episodes for free at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Back on episode 94, we had Sifu Gary Cecil. He came on, he talked about his love of martial arts. Really, at the heart of it, that's the subject that we talk about with all of our guests. But here he's back today to talk about Wu Chi Kung Fu, the style of martial arts that he is most passionate about, that he practices today. And it's a little bit different than what you might expect. You know, we could have someone on and, and they could give us an overview of Aikido. And they could talk about Aikido and it would kind of read more like a history. Well, that's not what today is. Today is far more fluid than that, far more variable. And really, that's pretty Wu Chi. You'll understand what I mean as we get into it. So sit back, hang on, and let's talk to Sifu Gary Cecil again. Sifu? Yeah, hey, Jeremy, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Fine. Nice to hear your voice. Been a while. Yeah, it has been a while. It's, you know, I, I don't often get to have people back on the show. So it's, this is fun. This is, this is a good time. Oh, okay. We're not, we're well, not, we're not starting just... from zero. No, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> So how can I be how can I be of help to your listeners today? Well, let's well well first I want to make sure am I using the right title? Are you Sifu because I looked back and that's what I referred to you as on the previous episode. Well, that's that's okay. That's a title I always love uh because I really am sort of the grandfather or a grandfather uh, that is to um so many of my students, you know, in, a, in that respectful and uh traditional way, but also now since last time, I think uh, the association uh, granted me the title of Dashi. I saw that uh, which your signature. Is another, yeah. What does that mean? Yeah. Well, it's just sort of the uh, most reverend, <laughs> right, reverend, a <laughs> 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 uh, respected title. I, I'm the founder of of the uh, association and its and its uh, executive, uh, and it's sort of the highest level of respect. Uh, made available to uh, someone, and so they voted that in last year, I think, okay. uh, as a as a council because I'd established a whole council for the association, and uh, they they did that for me, wanted me to have that title uh, oh, nice. of respect and and but also of responsibility to the organization what, as its representative. Mm -hmm. What would that title translate as? Well, I don't recall. I mean, I remember looking it up once. Um, and I don't really, I think you could Google it, but uh, my, my memory doesn't recall it right off the bat. Um, I, I probably could look it up for you. That's okay. Um, That's okay. I, I think we often get too bogged down in the supposed translation of titles. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I think that the meaning matters more. You know, I can... I could call you, I mean, even here in a martial arts context, I could refer to you with your first name in a very right. respectful way. I could also refer to you with your first name in a very disrespectful way. I think the intent matters so much more. Exactly. We're not big in the titles. They just want to show their respect. And, uh, and that, that was fine. I appreciated the, the thought. Uh, we, uh, we have various titles for ranks, but it's more just to... Uh, say thank you for, for hard work. I think that's kind of the bottom line for it. Sure. Uh, All right. Now we have you on today to talk about your style. And, and this is a little unique because while most of our guests, when they come on, when we do what we call the Monday show, the, the kind of standard interview conversation, talk about your story, 
we hear a lot about people's styles. We hear a lot about, you know, how they found certain styles, how it worked for them, things like that. But you're on today to talk specifically about your style. Mm-hmm. So I have no idea how this is going to go. This this could be, well, I know that you and I are going to have fun. I can't speak right. for the listeners. And, <laughs> right. you know, to a, to a certain degree, I don't know that I care. Because whatever we do an episode, it is, if I'm not interested in doing it, I'm not going to do it. And uh-huh. we've learned that, you know, at least most of the folks out there enjoy it. So, yeah. So let's let's start. Tell us about your style. I'm not even going to throw any words in as a segue. I want you to tell us about what it is. You were just talking about the organization. So what is this organization? What style is it charged with representing? And tell us a little bit about that, and then we'll go from there. Okay. Uh, the style we're representing is, is a uh, version of Shaolin influence from our direction, though it's got broader roots than that. Uh, Wu Chi Chen Fa has a, a rather uh, interesting but rather difficult history to trace, and I sent you some documentation showing some of my thinking and research in that direction, but it's not been clear, and it's really hard to to verify some of the data that we receive, and so I've been careful how I use it. But I've also done a little personal investigation even on foot, when I went into Nepal years ago, I was looking for clues as well there. Um, though I was there for another reason. I was spending some time watching for any evidence of rumors about how martial arts in general had started in that region. I mean, this this spans beyond just Wu Chi Kung Fu, Wu Chi Chan Fa, which is kind of like Wu Chi form, uh, fist form, you know, if you want to be more specific. Uh, but a lot of the Kung Fu styles were often referred to as Chan Fa. You have Tai Chi Chan or Tai Chi Chi Chan Fa, when it, uh, which is fist method uh, with Tai Chi, you know, and Wu Chi fist method or form um, is what we represent, which is more of a philosophy than actually a, a specific style of moves. Uh, and that's one reason that it's been very uh, helpful to our schools to talk about uh, Wu Chi in, in terms of its philosophy of movement and its way of thinking about martial arts, because it really has been a, a philosophy uh, that's found within the Shaolin, but also um, other uh, schools of thought have picked up on it in various forms over the decades, over the centuries, uh, because it really embodies uh, an approach to how one defends oneself or trains the body and disciplines the mind and the spirit. And that approach is, is as much uh, of what we're about than being a specific set of moves that everybody does the same thing, uh, not always, and, you know, choreographs the same way. What you will find, what's really neat about Wu Chi schools, Wu Chi Kung Fu schools, is that you might go into one school and experience an art, and then go into another school around the world, and it looks totally different because we don't have a lot of prescribed forms and movements uh, that everybody has to do the same. But whatever we do has to conform to our uh, understanding of the art, the philosophy, and the basic uh, principles under which uh, that undergird what we do. Uh, we do have uh, – so you would see some similarities with with how they, they practice and what they're trying to accomplish, but uh, you would not necessarily same, see the same prescribed forms. In fact, in the tradition of Wu Chi Kung Fu, I think there are several families that emerge from different schools of thought. You've got the M.A. Mountain tradition, which is the highest mountain in China, where a lot of martial arts is practiced. Uh, you've got the uh, – Shaolin sect, which is I'm more familiar with because my roots were through a Shaolin master. Uh, you have the Wudang Mountain group, which would be closer to Tai Chi uh, and that type of philosophy. And then there's a wandering sect, <laughs> which I think never really settled into one home place, but sort of went, it went around as mercenaries or whatever they were doing, uh, <laughs> and refining their art as they traveled around from school to school or place to place just expanding their knowledge. 
I've been in, in conversation over the years with uh, a representative of the Wandering Sect. Uh, I've talked with a master uh, in, as far as Australia, who uh, I'm not, I don't think I even asked him what sect he thinks he's associated with, but he's the one that pointed me to our roots probably being somewhere in the Kunlun Mountains near Tibet. And again, not far from Nepal and that whole region where a philosophy developed that took on form and also that form uh, influenced how they began to practice their self-defense. It's, that's, about, that's about the gist of it. But okay. again, Wu Chi Chan really represents a way of thinking about martial arts. And uh, that gives us some common ground with a lot of arts. We can talk with a lot of artists and find common ground because of that. Sure. Now, that's certainly a part of the world that it's not that far off. You know, we, we talk about China as possibly or the, depending on your perspective, origin of what we come to think of as Eastern martial arts. But Nepal, Tibet, these are countries, you know, I mean, you know, there, there's no there's no big wall there, you know, but there is a property line in a sense. We don't talk about martial arts coming from there terribly often but of course if you look on a map it's not really that far off no and i, I think uh, people like uh, and historians would have a hard time associating religion with the proliferation of martial arts and i think that's fair but at some point when the buddhists began expanding out of india into nepal and up into tibet and over into china they the uh, uh, disciplines they brought with them fed into the martial arts that were already taking place in villages, in regions, and among uh, various uh, soldiers, etc., that that began to form um, or influence what we now think of as kung fu. You know, everybody had martial arts. I mean, India had them. Anywhere in the world, you find martial arts. How they defended themselves, how they fought. But what what began to, I think, develop what we know as kung fu was the Taoist and Buddhist beliefs, um, and, and Confucianism as well. I mean, the, the, the religious culture, or quasi-religious culture, though not directly uh, perhaps impacting how they fought uh, in one level, it did have an influence on how certain training methods spread and they were used uh, for meditation, personal development, strengthening the body, and how that then fed into the way they began to practice self-defense. So there's a connection there. Uh, I'm trying to be careful in respect to the historians, but sure, sure. Uh, you know, yet at the same time, it's hard to deny that where the Buddhists went, they took with them certain disciplines that fed into how people began to practice what we associate with the Shaolin tradition. And everybody, almost everybody agrees that somewhere along the way, you have to pay homage to Shaolin if you're going to call yourself a Kung Fu. <laughs> yeah. right. So, right. you know... I don't think it's too hard to to consider that people of faith or of combat of military are going to spread martial arts. I mean, when when we look at martial arts in the United States, it's not too hard to see that you know, it all comes out of World War II, American mm-hmm. soldiers stationed abroad, learning from someone, mm-hmm. coming back, teaching it, et cetera, you know, and, and it spread that quickly in really just a couple generations. Mm-hmm. Now you're talking about Wu Chi as a philosophy, so maybe mm-hmm. this is a good point to dig into that and talk about what you mean when you say it is a philosophy rather than a codified set of movements. Well, uh, there are certain precepts uh, that we teach and principles, uh, and they're not precise from sect to sect either. But uh, Wu Chi is a is a if you well, let me put it this way: people understand Tai Chi as a philosophical principle, uh, where it's the, the the separation of the of uh, into yin and yang, and so there's a ph- philosophical association with the art of Tai Chi, where they use this balancing force of you know of of light and dark, which might be a say, of force and of you know of, re- of retreat. And uh, forward motion, motion to left and right. Um, the the idea of this separation into this yin and yang influences the way they practice their art. 
Uh, Wu Qi happens to be a philosophical principle that goes uh, into the very beginning. It's the, the one. It's, it's actually the nothingness that you find in both, um, well, you find it in almost every religious tradition. Uh, I, I, as a Christian pastor, uh, read Genesis 1 and see the Wu Qi philosophy embedded in, in the first chapter of Genesis. I mean, it is there so clearly in the beginning, and that idea of the beginning uh, and how creation unfolds in that story is representative of the primordial energy that Wu Qi represents. It's an effort to tap into our sense of being and uh, life, uh, being aware that there is this energy that began from the very beginning of time that is life itself, and what the Chinese would call qi, or the Japanese would call ki, this life force. Wu Qi pays attention to that. We pay attention to breath, breath control, uh, which uh, in, in Indian, Hebraic, and Greek philosophies all translate and show themselves as breath is, is associated with spirit. Uh, and there is an intimate connection with the very gift of breath in our vitality. Uh, and, of course, yoga teaches that. I mean, so many, so many martial arts teach that. Uh, so Wu Qi Kung Fu pays attention to some of these basic principles of, of uh, health. Uh, we want to, to uh, form our um, – we want to fashion our movements uh, upon a strong foundation of vitality and energy so that when we perform a, a movement, when we have a, a set of moves we uh, apply to a defensive situation, we are uh, doing that, I guess you might say, I hate to sound, I don't quite know how the right word, maybe to harmony, you know, to, that we move with a sense of harmony with our situation, our, our sense of who we are, um, and, and from somewhere within ourselves, we respond appropriately. The, um, and, and so we're paying attention to those foundational principles that begin from the very beginning. There's, there's a lot of teaching, even in Shaolin and, and in Taoism as well, about this primordial state of things. You'll find a lot of literature on returning to the primordial uh, energy, the, 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 the chi that came out of creation itself, and how the mystics and the different... Uh, uh, monks and so forth try to talk about that and practice that in their daily walk and their daily practice. And that's kind of where Wu Qi Kung Fu comes from. We uh, don't forget our fundamental uh, roots in uh, that. And, that's, and actually, I would say it's a humility, the idea of emptying ourselves of self to allow um, there to be room for uh, tapping into to an awareness of what's around us and the energy that surrounds us and what's going on in our world. Mm. Uh, an openness. We try to cultivate a certain openness to to our practice and to others who come into our sphere. Okay. I, uh, I think I'm with you. One of the things that's striking me about your description is how much it reminds me of the way Tai Chi has been presented in most of its more kind of modern, less combative iteration, the ideas of, mm -hmm. of harmony and balance and all that. Is that by accident, or do you think there's some synergy in there? I think there's some synergy. When you see, when you see the Wu Dang sect or the Wandering sect practice their, their Wu Qi forms, uh, they can sometimes look very much like Tai Chi. Uh, and in fact, the, 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 in the Shaolin sect, uh, when you do some research, there was a, this art that was practiced more by the elders of the Shaolin temple that's related to what's called Ruchan, soft movement, soft form, that is related to what we would now call, uh, what they began to call later Shaolin Tai Chi, Shaolin Tai Chi, uh, which was really a nickname for what we understand to be the basics of Wu Qi Kung Fu. So it was a softer side to the Shaolin art, 
an art uh, in some respects that, that re- had a relationship, I think, to what we would recognize as maybe Tai Chi-like movements. Uh, but there's also a hard side to it, too. Uh, and it had a lot of force and power, like some people say Tai Chi does as well. But Shaolin sort of disguised this Wu Chi Kung Fu as Shaolin version of Tai Chi. And there probably was some influence from Wu Dang Mountain and all that. As I mean, a lot of these martial artists traveled back and forth, and they, you know, there was a lot of give and take and sharing of techniques among different people as they traveled the lands. There's no doubt there was a lot of cross-pollinating of stuff back and forth uh, across China. And I think some of that shows in, when you see how uh, you take a Shaolin art um, and begin to see that that kind of influence showing itself even there. Uh, See, Shaolin can be very, very uh, rigid, uh, very difficult. Of course, it's a very hard style of training, very physically demanding. And like myself, when you get older, you find you have to soften up, and so there had to be another way to practice. And the the older masters found that softening up the technique and flowing more, being more like water rather than fire, uh, suited them quite well. And in fact, it helped improve their art, and they became very efficient in that. So my, my teacher was showing me some stuff that he called Shaolin Tai Chi that has become foundational to me and probably the formative place from which we fashioned our version of Wu Chi Kung Fu. Uh, because what I teach is not solely representative of all Wu Chi Kung Fu, but I follow its philosophy and have adopted that methodology, that more and more not so much methodology, I'm sorry, that, that uh, those, those precepts and principles in fashioning the curriculum we teach in our particular association. But our association by no means ca- uh, captures the whole of what one might find to be the world of Wu Chi Kung Fu. It's just not been talked about much. You know, we, sure. We're considered esoteric art. Nobody's heard of us. And I've decided um, in this day and age of information exchange and how open we are, we need to be a little more transparent about who we are and what it is we practice. Because you, you know, most people have never heard of Wu Chi Chan or Wu Chi Kung Fu. One of the things that's really striking me about what you're talking about here with with Wu Chi is the way you're presenting it, the way you're presenting what you teach and how you teach it is a complete 180 from the way most people would talk about the martial art that they inherited from their instructor. You're, you're using the word version, and you're saying it's not the be-all, end-all definition of what Wu Chi is, and it's bringing a smile to my face. It, oh, it's, good. <laughs> you know, it, it's this, one of the things that drives me crazy is this notion that there is only one way to do a thing, and that any particular person to say, my way is the right way to do that thing, that just drives me insane. Now, is this something that is, I don't want to say unique, but something that we would find among the majority of practitioners of Wuchi, or is that something that is, you know, a little more rare and something that you see in, in, you know, your organization and maybe some folks adjacent to you? No, I think you would find, if you find a true Wuchi Chan uh, or Wuchi Kung Fu practitioner, that's what you'll find. Uh, you'll find that, uh, and they follow certain principles that have been very tried and true in the overall martial arts history, especially back in the temples of China and so forth. But for instance, you know, testing a technique. You know, we we have, we, I allow, see my schools, you go to each one of my schools, they're all going to be different. That's what blows people away. How do you manage that? They're not all teaching the same thing. <laughs> But they are. I understand what I'm saying in terms of how they apply it. Uh, and I allow each instructor to have some latitude about what they, that works well for them so that they can put their personal stamp on their school. It's got to be something they're excited about. Uh, we, we do have our roots in Shelley. I mean, all of my people learn the fundamentals of the five animals or other and other animals in Kung Fu styles. They understand five animals as the foundation. They understand certain uh, Qigong uh, forms that we teach that we do re- we do in my association we do require a basic set of things to get them started but then they can take those basics and do all kinds of things with them uh, they can innovate 
as long as they follow the principles of, of proper application of energy and understanding of the movement. Uh, basically, I tell them, how's it fight? Well, does it work or not? You have to test it. You know, you can't just do something pretty. It's got to work. If it doesn't work, we throw it out. And it has to, to have um, other principles applied to it as well. But, yeah, I've got a school in Grand Forks, North Dakota, for instance, that teaches predominantly tiger style. You go to that school, you go into a tiger kung fu school. Uh, I've got another school in Minneapolis that it has gone more toward uh, Crane and Phoenix and Snake. Uh, and it looks totally different than the other school in Grand Forks. Both of them, though, uh, follow the same precepts of sorts that guide their practice. You know, we understand that no matter what you do, it's going to require hard work, which is the meaning of Kung Fu. You've got to practice hard. You've got to focus. Uh, the, the common things to all good schools now, by the way, not just us. And, and you might walk into one of my schools and think you're seeing something that looks like a you know school you visited before <laughs> someplace else because we do have common ground. If if my teacher, if I have an instructor that finds a a method that they really like from another school, and and are given permission to to, to use it, they'll they'll take it and apply it in their school if it works. You know if it fits their uh, their personality as a school and fits, you know, and passes our principles in terms of, of its application, um, they're welcome to apply that. So we do a lot of Aikido. We do Judo. We're fairly eclectic in some ways, which is true. To, here, here's where I find the common ground for that store, for that application. It is believed, and this is one of the legends that I actually give some credence to because it keeps kind of coming back and makes sense. Uh, and there's symbolism this with the number, but many, many different martial artists gathered over the centuries on M.A. Mountain, the highest mountain in China, Sacred Mountain. And that was a safe place for martial arts to go and gather and practice. And there they could meet other martial arts from around the country, and they could share techniques and practice together and hone their skills. Mercenaries fled there at times. Uh, even bandits and so forth might find their sanctuary there. Um, the legend has it that somewhere along the way, a practitioner was watching these different great martial artists practice and, and said, I like that. And I looked over here and said, I like that. He looked over here and he said, I like that. And pretty soon he had taken the best techniques that he was seeing on the whole mountain and began to put them together into a, to something that he felt, I'm going to use the best of the best. That's what I want to do. And he took 36, he took from 36 different forms of Kung Fu and brought that together and called it Wu Chi Kung Fu. Um, and from there, from M.A. Mountain, he, he it spread you know, to various parts of China, like to the Shaolin and to Wudang and so forth. Now, that's a legend, but it sort of tells you the mindset is that uh, if we see something that is, is wor it works and it's practical and it, it fits into how we practice, how we see self-defense being effective, we're not afraid to say, well, we want to honor that. So if uh, Shito Ru or um, Shorin Ru or somebody else has a technique that goes, wow, you know, we see that and go, wow then we may start teaching that in one of our schools. Um, that's fascinating. That's okay. and it's something, yeah, it, that, you know, that, that speaks to my heart. I was pretty blessed. My initial martial arts upbringing was, was, you know, very open and very much, um, I don't want to say one that would steal from everyone because there's kind of a negative connotation to that, but, but borrowing, yeah. but looking for synergy, looking for things that would work well in the toolbox and round out individual people's kind of complement of of movements. And when you spoke to the ideas of, of Aikido and Judo, you answered the question that I was was wanting to ask. Could could you see Wu Chi philosophy kind of in you know non Chinese arts? But I guess you could. I guess you could. That you know, you might call it something else, but uh, if you have this, uh, you know, in 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 the 
in the Christian tradition, we have a we have a sense of kenosis, and what that means is emptying, um, where one empties as our as Jesus emptied himself. It says in a place in the Bible, um, though he could have had it all, had all power and all glory, he emptied himself and took on the form of a servant. It's one of Paul's passages, and I'm not trying to preach here, but but illustrate to you that uh, as a as a Christian pastor. That passage speaks volumes to me about the concept of Wu Qi, because it's really an empty circle. When you draw it, it's one of its representations, a circle, a zero, naught. And that not that where we all kind of begin? <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, you can see yourself as, as empty, so that, and this is an old proverb, so that you can be filled. You know, if you're already full, then nothing, anything that's poured into you to simply falls over the brim, and you gain nothing. So there's this continual idea of being empty, um, and emptying ourselves of presuppositions or prejudices so that we can receive, we can learn. We need to be, Wu Chi Kung Fu is about being teachable, just being teachable, and being open to uh, one another and to your environment, being aware. Uh, it's, It's also being respectful being open enough that you respect what others might bring into your circle. Um, we won't, we are, my students go into the class expecting to receive something new that, they, that raises their eyebrow, puts a laugh on their lips, or they go, wow. And, and it enriches them every class. They, they go away, hopefully filled with something new and something different. They come back to the next class and we say, all right, empty yourselves of any preconceptions, expectations, and just, Let's just have fun and receive what you receive and, and be filled with something. Um, that's, that's very fundamental to so many good martial arts. It's not unique. Uh, I think we do share some of those common ground with good, good martial arts that teach a good philosophy. Um, and I distinguish that. I say that on purpose because we know that in every discipline there are those who do not represent well what it, what it should be, <laughs> and there are those who do. Uh, and I'm not naming any names. No, no, no need. Think, no, of course, no need. But you know, we want to represent the the best side of what it means to to develop the person, to uh, respect one another, and uh, also that. I just my goal has been to to just help build better people. We want to be good citizens, good people, good family members, do well in our our jobs, you know, and. Uh, maintain a certain self-discipline that will work for the good of our families and our community along the way. Uh, yes. Self-control, a sense of faith. You have to have faith in something. Uh, the, the interesting to me, and can, I never, I, I didn't, I, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I want to, one of the things I do when, I, when I'm talking to someone is I, I try to imagine if there was an audience behind me and they had buttons and they, they could press that button for me to dig a little deeper. A whole right. bunch of buttons just went off when you said that. So mm-hmm. when you say they have to believe in something, what do you mean? Well, it, interesting, the first tenet of Wu, of Wu Chi Kung Fu is have faith. Now, for me as a Christian, I think that would be apparent what I have faith in sure. or who I have faith in. Uh, you don't have to be a Christian, though, to study in my school, and I'm not sure all of them are, if any means. But uh, what my teacher passed on to me, and he was, he was a committed Christian later on, but early when I began with my teacher, he was, you know, he grew up in a Christian environment, but he wasn't really a, a committed to it. It was somewhat secular. But he still had this sense of faith. He respected faith. He looked for faith. And what did he mean? First of all, can you trust somebody else? Um, you know, when you go into our schools, you have to trust your partner, and you have to trust your teacher. Faith also means trust, if you go back to its origins in in the Greek. And um, who do you trust? Can you trust this art? I mean, in other words, do you trust what you see and experience? Can you trust that your partner is going to take care of you out there when you're practicing? Uh, There's a certain degree you can't get better unless you trust somebody. You've got to trust the people you train with and trust your teacher and trust the content. You test it, but you trust it as you test it. Uh, we have to teach people to trust uh, in, and, and that it works. So here, test it out, and then 
you learn to trust yourself. You know, I can do this. And, and all of a sudden you begin to trust your technique and trust your ability to, to perform and, and reach a higher level. So there's a very personal side to that word, have faith. You, uh, your ability to trust the art and its integrity and those who teach it to you. If you can't trust anyone, it's hard to learn anything. It's hard to do anything. And so that's our first tenet, uh, is, is building a sense of trust in your school and within your school and making sure that the teachers also respect their students enough that they can trust the teacher. So we have a high sense of integrity involved in what we do uh, and, and that we are trustworthy in how we handle this art and this, you know, these many potentially deadly techniques that you have to have a sense of integrity that those techniques would be guarded and and uh, practiced in responsible ways. Uh, and no one that we don't want anyone to be hurt, or we don't want to abuse anyone. We don't want to bully anyone. Uh, so we do build a, have a certain ethic that goes behind what we teach, and that is not different at all from the other side of, of my influence, which was from Miyagi Sensei. Uh, my other, the other side that I brought partly into my association was my influ- influence from um, the more Chinese side of what many people call Goju Karate, but I picked up uh, picked up on that in its more in its earlier stages when it was influenced out of southern China. Uh, it would be called Gang Ru, uh, Gang Ru Chan, which is sort of the, what Goju Ru Karate is. Uh, so when you God. say when you say Miyagi, you're talking Chosen Miyagi. Some of the founder, not, yeah, not yeah the Karate Kid, not the Karate Kid. <laughs> I just I'm talking about the founder sure. of Goju, yeah, right. who who studied in southern China with Shaolin and others, and brought that art back, and then he melded it with the local Okinawan art called Te, or you know just hand, and so Miyagi takes sort of the local Okinawan defense melds that into what he brought back from southern China and forms Goju. Well, I'd likewise take my Shaolin roots, meld it with what I brought, what I picked up from Okinawa, from my teacher who was, I guess, third generation from Miyagi. Um, and um, that, that some of those techniques have made their way into what I teach. So, um, uh, but likewise, you know, it had an ethic. Miyagi himself taught his way was peace. And he was not. He was against conflict and violence. You know, he 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 taught that your goal is basically. Miyagi said things like, you know, don't get hit and don't hit. <laughs> you know, that was yeah. As he grew older, particularly, he was don't get hit and don't hit. Walk away. You know, I mean, he had a very peaceful approach to his his art, and I think people forget that sometimes. When you look makes over your, to me. it makes complete sense to me. And, and, you know, mm-hmm. one of the things that I don't mention on the show very often, but the thing when I consider everything I've done in martial arts and the thing I am most proud of is that I've managed to diffuse every fight that nearly happened. That is true martial arts. And, yes. and yes. I, when I reflect on that, you know, the more mm-hmm. I reflect on them, that the, and the older I get, the more proud of it I am. Mm-hmm. So. Yes, and and that's where Miyagi was toward the end of his life, and his son also. But how proud he was, I think, of teaching this peaceful path um, in his last days, especially. Uh, I think he died in fifty-seven. We left a great legacy, and you know there are many. There's some Goju schools out there today that I think really still embody his teaching. And uh, every every system has somebody like that they turn back to. You've got Itosu and Funakoshi, and so many great guys from that era that you know have handed down martial arts as we know it now in their different styles and forms. But when you pre- if you were to press back historically, you'd find some of these common threads. And and Wu Chi Kung Fu just again uh, picks up some common threads like that, but we make we make it more of a priority. Uh, we again, we it's not just about the techniques as much as you know the we put a priority on the principles behind it and what we what we learn behind it. 
Uh, and I think that's the difference maybe in how we practice versus some schools where you do, you do the prescribed movements. So it becomes just, I do these movements, I get my belt. Uh, you can come do all the movements you want to in my school, but you don't get your belt unless you've got the integrity to go with it and the understanding to go with it. When you... So we have a high premium on not only doing it, but understanding why you do it, how you do it, and what would be the point. Why would you do that? <laughs> or why not? <laughs> uh, you know, there has to be a real practical application to life involved in what we do. And so our black, my black belts, if you get a black belt in my school, which takes a long time, by the way, uh, you're going to be a decent person. You'll have some sense of what's right and wrong, and you'll do the right thing. That's a subject that comes up in martial arts conversations from time to time. The idea that, you know, we, we we can all kind of generally agree that martial artists become better people in, in the vast majority of the time, and martial artists on the whole are better than the general population. But you just expressed it as if there's a a standard that people are held to. Is that, am I hearing you right? In my schools, there's a standard we're held, we're held okay. to. Now, again, I, it's not... I'm not uh, discriminating that they have to be, for instance, Christian or whatever. However, they just simply have to respect my Christian principles. I'll ask them to do is you have to respect that I'm a Christian pastor. I have a certain understanding of how things work. And since, I'm, since I'm the founder of this particular association, I, I need you to respect that. I don't want loose cursing going on in my schools. I don't want my, web, my Facebooks to be covered with inappropriate language and stuff. No. You know, so there are standards there, and that's for, some of that is my is a personal reflection on, of me. But it's also just a sense of common decency in our society, and <clears throat> something I think we're losing. You know, there's a loss of civility that a lot of pe- lots of people have talked about already. Nothing new there, mm. but it concerns me greatly. And and even when I look back in history at some of the old masters, they had similar concerns. Uh, you know, someone like an Itosu, who was maybe one of the toughest fighters in in, Jap- in the Japanese art, uh, who basically just folded up one day and quit. He said he was irrelevant. His way of thinking and acting was dead, become irrelevant in society. And he just quit, <laughs> walked away. I'm going, wow, what happened there? <laughs> you know, what? <laughs> you know, uh, you know, we are people of our times, and we have to ad- learn to adapt. The, one of the other tenets, by the way, that we teach is be adaptable. And that is where I, it's also important. I know that things change and societies have their issues. I want my people to be able to function uh, effectively and appropriately uh, within an environment that changes quickly on us sometimes. Not just about self-defense, but just about dealing with people. Um, but you can do that with, uh, again, holding your head up with a sense of integrity. Uh, and and Finding your center, your place, and all of that is important to me. Uh, my black belts have to be a good representation of our school, and <clears throat> I. Uh, so we have certain standards. Now, again, they're not spelled out like the Ten Commandments per se, but we all understand what that looks like. I think when when the board gets together and talks about our our black belts or our, our new advancements, we all have a sense of how they embody the things we've taught. You know, do they have it? To, you know, how do they display their trust for one another, their collegiality, their um, adaptability, their respect? You know, we we do measure those things, especially when they get to a black belt test. How? How? Yeah, uh, I, I, I I support it, but to me, it's always very subjective. And you know, we do have a lot of school owners that listen to the show, so. Anytime we can talk about these these things that I feel help move martial arts forward, help move the ability to raise, educate better students forward, I want to ask those questions. Well, first of all, we are we cultivate personal relationships with our students. Um, we we go beyond simply having a class. We develop a fellowship, and that's one of the things I think has been a strength in the Wu Chi Kung Fu Association. We all see each other as family, and I'm sure you have. You've probably heard that before, but yes, it's more than just going to class and then walking away. 
I mean, there is a fellowship that occurs. Often they go out to dinner together. They get to know each other. We have conversations. We dialogue. We ask the questions. I try to be available to all of my students and my instructors as well to answer questions, to get to know them personally myself on some level, uh, to the point that uh, as you get to know a person, uh, it, you're not just looking at their performance on the floor now, but you know who that person is who stands on the floor in front of you. This is not just a disembodied, you know, I mean, I mean just a, a person wearing a sash or something that's looking for a belt. This is someone that has, uh, that, of whom you have some knowledge and personal experience. You've seen them interact with other people. You know something about them. You know how they've been in conversation, how they've dealt with difficulties in their lives. You've been a part of their life, and they've been a part of yours. So how? It means you have to invest it in relationships. Uh, you know, if you're an instructor who just simply sees these students come forward on a mat, and, uh, and can they do the technique, and then you pass them on, I think you've missed an opportunity. Because, the, you know, and that's again, that's our second principle, by the way. Uh, our second tenet is, uh, this form of, um, and I've had a hard time translating that from its original, but the, the second tenet of Wu Chi Kung Fu is, is that. It's about encouraging and uh, developing your students beyond simply a performance of a move or a duty or a form. But uh, how do you encourage their growth as people? Uh, and that means um, it implies a certain personal engagement and respect that the teacher has for the student, as well as expecting the student to respect the teacher. Um, what are the other tenets or, or precepts? Well, I think I've already basically. Uh, you, you mentioned the core. You mentioned two at, at length, and we, we've we've meandered a bit. So I, I I may I may have missed them or not recognized that they were on that that. For that structure. Well, and um, you know, I, I toss them around a lot at different times myself, and uh, sometimes I need to stop and, and think about them a little bit again. But uh, <laughs> uh, in essence, um, you know, the idea of, of the ability to trust, and I, and I've, the reason I've hesitated is because I've also sort of toyed with them in terms of trying to make them more understandable. Uh, because the second one was uh, it was given to me in a way that this didn't quite translate well, um, and I think it's because it probably come from Chinese thought of the idea of do not interfere. But everything else was more of a positive, like be adaptable and follow the way. Now, if you're a Taoist, you'd understand follow the way. If you're a Christian, you'd understand follow the way in a different way. Right. Uh, or if you're just a martial artist, you know there's the way of the way of of uh, of the art. Uh, so that's that that would have to be translated. But basically, it's have faith. Uh, do not coerce or manipulate another's energy um, for your own ends. Don't take advantage of your students. Um, in ways that are inappropriate, but really, it, it's more like likely saying, you know, have faith and build up each other, build up others, uh, be adaptable and follow the way. Those are, uh, in essence, four tenets of Wu Chi Chan. Um, and I think you leave that open to the interpretation a little bit, on purpose, especially follow the way. Uh, I think each student will have to dialogue about that with their teachers and colleagues. What does that mean? Have some conversations. Follow, follow your, follow the way. And what way is that for you? What's the way for you? Um, so there's some personal journey involved there, and discovering what the way is. When you found Wu Chi, because I, I, I forget, and even if I hadn't forgotten, I, I would still ask this question. If this was your first art, was was Wuchi the first thing, first martial art you trained in? 
No, no. I began with with the uh, with the Gangru uh, Goju. Okay. Uh, I came more from Miyagi side of it first. Okay. So when you found this, what what was that like? Because well, everything you're talking about is so so open to even the most open martial arts school I've attended. This sounds like a more open system, if we can even use that term. <laughs> yeah, that's why it's been hard for us to actually. We've had to work hard to find some definition. You know, you still have to have some some concrete um, places to settle down. You know, <laughs> so you can't be. You have to have at least a a, a fence post. You know, of, of things you you hold to in terms of techniques and things. Um, but I, you know, we just challenge each school to to set that standard. You know, they have to work on setting their curriculum, and I have to approve it. It has to show, it has to demonstrate its connection to to our principles. Um, you know, and we have other we have precepts too, and all that that we teach about awareness and not judging others, um, et cetera. So, uh, and not judging a technique, prejudging a technique until you try it out. Uh, about integrity and sincerity, uh, and that your words and your actions need to match up, uh, and being uh, gain, developing a certain insight and understanding to things, and being a responsible person. We teach those things too. But uh, yeah, I, I was practicing martial arts very young uh, through a an Okinawa a, a instructor came from Okinawa in the Miyagi tradition. Um, got lucky to to fall upon that and find that, uh, and also was very curious about the martial arts overall. So, like a lot of people in my generation, we were enthralled with Bruce Lee, and we, you know, you and I've been over this territory before, so I'm gonna be a little oh, careful yeah. or not to repeat all that. No, no, but, that's okay. We we are gonna link just for for folks that are listening. We are gonna link in the show notes to your your past episode. Of course, it's still available. They're all still available, and if you haven't. You know, if you're new to the show or something, whistlekickmarshwartsradio dot com. So, uh, please continue. <laughs> great. So anyway, uh, but I had a great experience with my my colleagues and, and my teachers. Uh, I, I practiced all I could, and even when I couldn't be at classes because of transportation needs out there as a kid, uh, I had some other high level people in the class who would work with me and keep me up and so forth. So that when I did get back to class, I was up to speed. Et cetera, et cetera. And uh, it was a great experience because it was a really down to earth, hardcore uh, martial arts class. The way that you know that you hear about the old schools, you know, it well, this was um, bare knuckle sparring, um, but with control. Uh, this was um, you know we did throws and had no mats, you know, all kinds of stuff like that, you know the yes. good stuff you know, <laughs> that you hear stories about now. Uh, you know, there were injuries, and that's the, the downside of that kind of training is there are injuries. And then also we learned later even the concerns about um, their southern-style uh, white crane influence showing up with what's called uh, San Chin in the Japanese or Sam Chim you know, from the Chinese version of it, often practiced in some other southern kung fu styles, with a lot of tension work and the breathing. Uh, that that we came to find that if you did that incorrectly, that had real health consequences. I mean, that became dangerous. People died from doing that for 20 years of their training, uh, from hypertension and so forth. So, uh, you know, we've learned a lot since then. And I've had to change the way I've taught things because of, of new discoveries about our science. I mean, look at what's happened with concussions, how that's come to the fore in just the last few years. Um, you know, we 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 do we keep learning, but um, I, it was old school style, uh, and and I enjoyed it. I started teaching uh, when I went to college, but then when I went to college, I was I was found or discovered by someone. Basically, they found me. I didn't find them, and uh, that's the way it was with Wu Chi Kung Fu too. I it found me. I really wasn't looking for it, uh, it and that's hard to explain, but. As I got deeper into that that uh, Shaolin style school, American Shaolin experience, um, and sort of by chance opened the door for my teacher to show me some things that I'd never seen before, 
that I came later to understand to be this Shaolin Taiji, which I, then I discovered was also code for Wu Chi Kung Fu or Wu Chi Chan Fa. Uh, I, I found that I that I discovered something, or it discovered me because I was having ideas and notions about martial arts already forming in my mind and in my practice, and I put that together in a book actually for my schools uh, called The Circle and the Serpent. And we still have that book. We're going to republish it with new information, which was my vision, basically, for what martial arts ought to be. And after I wrote that out, after that, I found out that what I had written and discovered was consistent in a spooky way with an artist who was talking to me about Wu Chi Kung Fu. And we hooked up and started talking, and I found out that I was actually a Wu Chi practitioner, but didn't know what to call it. Actually, actually, I did. I called it Wu Chi. I found out there was a whole art of Wu Chi Chen Fa out there that embodied the same principles that I was talking about. And I had talked about these principles before I knew about these people or knew about this school. I had picked it up from my teacher, but he never called it that. He used code words, <laughs> this other thing, but uh, in other ways. But I discovered there's a whole organization, a whole bunch of schools around the world that practice these same principles and talked about it in the same way. I was blown away. I just, it, I mean, literally, I think it found me. It was a moment. It was moments of inspiration and 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 comprehension from things that were told to me and taught to me along the way that came together. When I organized the thinking, I found a home all of a sudden with other people who had similar approaches and saying a tradition that began to speak to, you know, they shared history with me that I didn't know about. And I began to pull it all together. It's taken years actually to pull some of this together. It's been a, a whole journey of discovery. But again, what I love about it is I think that's possible for any artist in any style. Um, you have, there are elements of what we do that you can find in, my teacher once told me that told it to me this way. It's really about it's not about the style. It's about the person. You know, any any martial arts can go on a, a, a journey of self discovery and evaluate what they're doing uh, in a way that they would come to some similar conclusions. Hmm. I'm sure there are a number of folks out there nodding along at quite a bit of what you've been saying, especially over the last couple of minutes. But if people mm. want to go a little deeper into Wu Chi, what resources are available to them? <laughs> Not many. <laughs> that's, okay. that's, that's part of the problem. Is that again? Th this is in in terms of legend, and most of all, we've had to work with is legend, mm. and it's so esoteric and little known about it that you get a little. If you look, if you spell it the right way and, and Google it, you have to have the right spelling too you'll find some things, and it's not even all consistent. Um, not a whole lot known about it. It's just called an esoteric art, uh, usually associated with the Shaolin tradition, but also Wudang. And um, I learned a lot of what I'm talking about from another practitioner, who a Wu Chi Chan artist uh, in California, uh, and his school. But uh, he also got me connected to some others around the world, uh, I mentioned a Sifu Aldo that I talked with a while back in Australia. And he's the one that pointed me toward some of the history uh, back toward the Kunlun Mountains, and that tradition. And that has a, a very esoteric uh, Qigong root there in the Kunlun Mountains that, that bled over into martial arts later, I think. So... Uh, it, it, and it's been a, a been a process of of uh, discovery. I, I don't know how else to put it. Self discovery, as well as actually connecting with people who understood what I was talking about and helped me understand more of what I was talking about. Uh, so I'm very grateful to to the few out there that stepped up and said, "Well, we're willing to talk to you." And there are a few schools out there that use the Wu Chi label that that may not actually share our principles. But, yeah. But no surprise there, right? <laughs> I mean, but it's so open. But it's so open that it can even be not open? I don't, there, there's a bit of a paradox uh, yeah, I there, I suspect. 
we are principle based though. I mean, we do insist on certain principles and, and they may vary a little bit from teacher to teacher, but we have these fundamental ideas anyway that we share, uh, more or less. So, that's great. Uh, well, and, and, but, but anyway, because we choose a philosophical concept, it could be, a, it can be used in so many different ways too. I mean, adapted to a lot of different titles and methods as well. This has been a lot of fun. And, and unfortunately with a, with a lack of online resources for us to direct people to, I guess I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit and ask, can, can people email you? Sure. Uh, and, and by the way, I, you can find some of my schools. Uh, I would refer you, for instance, to okay. uh, the Sinking Moon uh, School in okay, Minneapolis. We'll make sure we get this website up. Um, Sinking Moon School of Kung Fu in Minneapolis, I think, has a good re- has a pretty good presentation online. Uh, he's still developing it because in one of my newer schools. Um, but, uh, he, you know, he's, uh, communication is like his thing. So, oh, okay. you know, you'll find pretty decent stuff there. Um, and, uh, the, uh, I'm trying to, I'm going to look it up. I think you can just Google it. You'll find sinking moon. I want to find, uh, I will find the full title here for you. But, uh, also, we have the Wu Chi. Um, uh, we have a, some other. Just look up Wu Chi School of, of Self Defense, or you know, and so forth. You might find some different references there. Uh, okay. uh, in Grand Forks, there's that school on the website. They've been they've been going strong up there for quite a while. I don't think there's any information out yet. One of my newer schools starting up is going to be called the Fifth Dragon School of Wu Chi Kung Fu uh, by Pete Ferguson. He's working on that, and uh, I think he's going to be down toward Fargo. I've got some people, uh, I mean, I've got some people that practice classes, but I don't think they've really gone online a lot. You know, we've got some folks that really haven't advertised. They just teach mm-hmm. uh, because we don't do it commercially. We really have done this as an act of uh, fellowship and love for years because none of my teachers get salaries out of this. They just basically charge whatever they have to, to, to order the uniforms and in some cases pay the rent. And that's all it is. Um, again, they love the art and that's why they do it. Uh, so um, I'm here. I'm trying to go to Google here myself. That's okay. We can, we, we can add these in. After the fact, we'll, we'll we'll put some stuff up on the show notes, and um, you know, you, you may have some some of your schools that you know have have some newer resources or something that we haven't, you know, we haven't talked about, or, or maybe you didn't even know popped up. Who knows? I, I want to make sure we get some good stuff at the show notes. But there was one last question I wanted to ask you. Mm-hmm. You know, when we have when we had you on before, I asked you, you know, what parting words would you would you have for everyone? And I'm going to take a little bit of a twist on that this time. What one thing would you hope people would take from Wu Chi into their own training? What one thing take from Wu Chi into their own training? So I'm talking to that general audience who may be in Taekwondo or absolutely, uh, you know, Shou uh, and Ru or some of these of those other type schools. Yeah. Um. I I think. The, the, the predominant principle behind what we do is what you've talked about already. Be, be open. Um, you know, if you think about that empty circle again, one of the ways to depict the Uchi circle of the creative, primordial creative moment before it divides into the Tai Chi, um, that it's, it's about potentiality. And when you're open, be open to the potential your own potential and potential of others. Uh, so an openness to, to, to that great potentiality within each of us. Uh, so don't sell yourself short, work hard, practice, and you can accomplish really amazing things. Uh, that's kind of the, the fundamental of what we do is an openness to your own potential as a, as a person and as a practitioner. I think that would be the one thing I would leave you with. I don't know that he put it in exactly these words, but Sifu's comment that so many of us are, in a sense, Wu Chi practitioners really resonated with me. 
throughout so much of what he said, I found myself nodding along saying, yes, that's, that's me. I believe that. I get that. Maybe I'm a Wuchi practitioner and I didn't even realize it. Who knows? I guess in a sense I can say I am. And I bet some of you out there are. Of course, we've got show notes with some links, everything that we've talked about today. If you want to dive deeper into Wuchi, maybe reach out to Sifu. You know, we've got that all over there. WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com as well as the link to his prior episodes where we talk more about him and his history, his path, his story as a martial artist. You know, I get really jazzed up listening to people talk about their martial arts story. And of course, you can find the rest of what we do at whistlekick.com. We're on social media, at whistlekick. Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram are our main outlets. And of course, Marshall Journal, marshalljournal.com. If you haven't been over there, it is blowing up, man. We've been posting something almost every day. It's crazy how quickly it's growing, and we're starting to get some attention. It's a lot of fun. We're looking for writers. We're looking for readers. If you want to reach out, you just want to say hi, or you have some feedback for the show, or a suggestion on a guest, or anything like that, I'm Jeremy at whistlekick.com. Super simple. That's all we've got for today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. (laughs) 